My name is Lee Fanwick. I'm interviewing Irv Knightlick today, August 11, 2009, for the Stanford Jewish Historical Society. Our DVD taker is Les Charlack. And now we're going to turn our introduction over to Irv Knightlick, who is very kind, Irv, to Hi. do this interview with us. questionnaire you're you're a real Connecticut Yankee or a New England Yankee oh wow <coughs> your mother was born in Boston, Boston so you're right. a little bit of a newer American than I am even <laughs> <laughs> tell me yeah. where did well, your mother's well, family originally come from my mother's family well, I guess originally they came from Poland and uh, my father came over here from uh, Russia Poland it was one of the two when he was about five years old. So uh, that's how close I come to being a Yankee doodle dandy. Right. Yeah, my mother was born here. Uh, then your father didn't run away from the Tsar's army as a lot of the no, men did at no, that no. time. As a matter of fact, with regard to the army of my father, uh, he was supposed to go into the army in 1917. And uh, fortunately, I was born at that time and they gave him a deferment. So uh, he's, I saved him <coughs> excuse me, from going into the army, and uh, Sharon saved me from going overseas. Hmm. Well, it was uh, good luck in both cases. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Tell me, uh, when you lived, how young were you when you left Boston? Oh, I was about 16 years old. So from Boston you moved to Brooklyn? Uh, yeah, we moved to Brooklyn, Borough Park as Borough. a matter of fact. And uh, we were there, well, we were there I guess until about, uh, oh, I'd say maybe 1940 or so, 1939. And uh, then we moved to Bensonhurst, so still uh, uh, Brooklyn. And uh, <clears throat> I, was, I lived in Brooklyn uh, until I got married. I guess Borough Park didn't look as it is today. No, no, I'm sure it is not the same as it was. It was no, a it was, uh, <clears throat> it was a Jewish community, mostly Jewish people, but uh, it wasn't like it is today. No, no. And uh, <clears throat> in 1941, I guess, when I met my wife, through a blind date, believe it or not, and uh, we got married on uh, February 14th, 1942. Where were you married? I'm sorry? Where were you married? In Brooklyn. In Brooklyn? Yeah, as a matter of fact, not far from where I lived. Uh, it was a place uh, just off New Utrecht Avenue. Uh, <clears throat> so it's funny how I met, if you're interested. Uh, a friend of mine called me up and he said, Irv, I have an invitation to a day, to a, a party. He says, and I can't go, I'm very ill. So I said, what do you want me to do? He says, go in my place, will you? Because I promised the girl that I would come. Mm, well, it's only around the corner, I'll go. So I uh, went to this place and Helen opened the door and I said, uh, I'm here instead of Herb. So, <laughs> but she couldn't talk. She had laryngitis. I said, oh boy, that's the woman for me. <laughs> so uh, we, we became uh, acquainted. I guess it was uh, just my... <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, <clears throat> we got married, and it's a funny thing. We were in the doctor's office having a blood test for the Wasserman test, and uh, he had the radio on, and they said the Japanese just attacked Pearl Harbor. So <coughs> he said, <coughs> "You still want to get married?" Absolutely. So we got married, <coughs> and that was it. Uh, I was working in a uh, machine shop, 
where I was a daytime foreman and mold, uh, plastic mold designer and anything else that came my way. So, uh, and we were working on some defense work. So I managed to get three deferments before they caught up with me and uh, I had to go. Then we, uh, I went to, uh, once I was inducted, they sent me to Aberdeen Paragoners and uh, I was there from 1943 to 1946, during which time I uh, was an instructor in the machine shop. Then, uh, then of course, uh, at the how about uh, but before just before the war ended, they uh, they wanted all instructors that hadn't been overseas had to go overseas. I was put into a uh, company that was slated to go overseas, and in that company were guys that went through my training course. I incidentally, at this time, I was acting corporal. I had no no rank. Uh, I said, "Gee, this is bad. I, I don't think I'm going to do this." So I immediately applied for OCS, and I was accepted in OCS. I was there for. A, Oh, maybe, uh, well, let's see, maybe a month or so, and uh, they uh, they decided that, uh, no, they called me up and uh, said, uh, we have, we're afraid that uh, you're not quite suited for this. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the report is that you're doing not doing too well as an instructor. He took me by surprise. I says, well, that's not true. I was one of the best instructors in uh, in a training center. Well, I'm sorry, but I think you can you can uh, appeal that and try to go again. I said, no, thank you. So well, what happened was the lieutenant that was in charge of my platoon was a southern cracker. And not only did he hate Jews, he hated anybody from the north. So he knocked off every one of us that was in that class. Oh, okay. So they sent me to heavy artillery school. What the hell do I know about heavy artillery? <laughs> Nothing. So the, uh, the, the chief of section there put me on a, a derrick, and he said, okay, now lift up that ground, that gun barrel up as high as you can get it, and then let it down slowly. Uh huh. So I got on this thing and I pushed the levers to get the thing up. It went up and up and up. And then reached the top. I said, "Okay, it's coming down," and I couldn't stop it. It just went around. I tried to stop and I couldn't hit the ground. So I said, "You see, I'm not really suited for this." <laughs> so he said, "Well, where were you before?" And I told him I was in the machine shop. And so it happened that some of the guys that I taught with in the machine shop were now officers in the permanent uh, ordnance school. So he said, well, I'll, I'll talk to the captain over and see what happens. So he talked to, he spoke to the captain and uh, apparently the friends of mine, who I, uh, the fellows I knew as instructors, okayed me and I got into that. So I taught in the permanent uh, installation and I was there until I was uh, discharged. So you never got overseas? Never got out, no. I was very fortunate. But that's the way it sometimes happens. All right. What high school did you go to in Brooklyn? What's that? What high school did you go to in Brooklyn? I went to New Utrecht High School. It was right near where I lived. It wasn't too bad. But what happened there, actually, I was going to a technical school in Boston, and I moved to New York when I was going into my uh, junior year, and I wanted to get into Brooklyn Tech, but in order to get into Brooklyn Tech, I had to start at the freshman year all over again. And no way, I got to get out of this thing. So uh, I went to New York, and of course, they gave me only half the credits that I earned in Boston because they weren't familiar with the curriculum. So uh, I went then. Uh, I was in my, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I was in my senior year, 
and uh, I went down to see the principal because I didn't have enough points to graduate. So uh, I got talking to him and he said, he said, you're from Boston? I said, yeah. He said, I went to Boston English High School. Oh, I said, that's one wonderful school. Hmm. I said, you know, the only problem, they didn't give me credits for some of the stuff I had. Don't worry, he says, I'll take care of it. So uh, <clears throat> he did, except for one thing, and this is interesting. He, uh, he couldn't give me credit for history, ancient history. That's what it was, ancient history. So he said, but if you want to, you can try to study something and uh, we'll take the regions. If you get, oh, if you pass the regions, why, then we'll give you the credit. Well, I got one of these review books. I read it and scored over that thing for about a couple of weeks. I took the regions. What do you know? I got 76. Never had the course, I just from what I read in the review books. So I was managed to pass, but I had to spend another six months after my senior year. So I graduated actually January of 1935. And from there, I, uh, I went to work. I worked with my dad. He was an, an erecting engineer. What he did was he installed ice machinery and dairy equipment and stuff like that. He worked for a company. And uh, I had got involved in radio and uh, other things. So, uh, and that, uh, then, uh, by the, let's see what happened after that. Well, there was nothing much. I went from one place to another. And uh, finally, after I was married, uh, just before I got married, uh, my, one of my friends, his father owned this machine shop. And he, he was always begging me to come to work for me. Uh, apparently, I decided I was going to go to work for him. And now the amazing thing, they had an order from Eastman Kodak. At that time, uh, injection molding was a new thing in this country, mostly done in Germany. So he says, we got a, an order to make a mold for this thing. It was called a blackhead remover. It looked like a hypodermic needle in reverse. You put it on a blackhead and pull it out and suction would pull the blackhead out. So I had never seen one before. They showed me the thing. And Okay, I designed them all for it, and I tried it out, and it worked fine. The guys from Eastman Kodak came down. Now, this time, I was a little over 20 years old, and to look older, I wanted a mustache, but I couldn't raise a mustache because I had blonde of red hair. So I used to take a eyebrow pencil <laughs> and pencil it in so that I look older. Anyhow, they came down, and they looked at them all, and said, that's great. That's, uh, who designed this? So. The uh, owner of the shop, my friend, pointed to me. He said, you're kind of young to be doing this, aren't you? He said, no, not really. <laughs> what am I going to say? <laughs> so from then on, I was designing uh, 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 plastic molds and t different tools and so forth and so on. And uh, I worked there, of course, until I went into the Army. So that's... Uh, that's about my story up to that point. But Tell me, was your family growing up, where, did you come from an observant family? I mean, what was that? An observant family, a family who was uh, religious or observant? Or? No, my, uh, my uh, wife's family were very religious. I wasn't. Yeah, oh, you were? <laughs> As a matter of fact, very interesting. Uh, when I was uh, young and I was... Uh, I, my grandmother decided it was time for me to go to Hebrew school. I said, well, later, later, that was about 12 years old, and a little before, 11 years old maybe, I was more interested in making model airplanes. And when I went to Hebrew school, I used to go into the bathroom, go out, of, out the door, and go <laughs> home, or go to some place where they make model airplanes. Is your grandchildren that you do this? <laughs> uh, I'm, telling, I'm telling my grandchildren the same thing, <laughs> and my great-grandchildren. Anyhow, uh, so my folks decided that they were going to hire a rabbi to come in and tutor me. Well, they came in and tutored me, and I learned my haftorah and everything, and I learned my speech. But would you believe? It was in Yiddish. I didn't speak a word of Yiddish. 
All I can remember is Lieber, Alteren, and Freunde, and alle versammelt. That's as far as I remember. <laughs> so, uh, but um, anyhow, we got through that. And uh, I managed to survive, even though uh, my wife was, was sort of, at that point, she was half and half. You know, her family was very religious. Uh, her grandfather and grandmother owned a hotel out in Far Rockaway. And uh, then they switched to Long Beach. As part of my initiation into the family, one time I was put into the room where they make salads. I made salads. Another time I went down the basement with Grandpa and tasted all the wooden cask that he had down there <laughs> full of wine. Believe me, I never tasted so much vinegar in my life. But uh, that was that. And, uh, Sounds like you were a typical teenage boy growing up. That's right. And, uh, and then uh, oh yeah, when I came back, I got uh, a job with a, um, a guy that made pliers. And uh, I designed a few pliers for him. We got the patent on one of them. And uh, I had an argument with him because he, he wanted his name on the patent, even though he had nothing to do with it. I do not do it. I was glad to get the patent on that. So um, then, uh, what happened? Oh, yeah, then I, I got, well, while I was still working uh, with him, I was going to school uh, for machine design, which I, I graduated from. And um, I, uh, I got disgusted with him and decided I was going to look for something else. My father-in-law, being a uh, electrical contractor, had a job out in Long Island City, and uh, I went into the store and he says, come on, take a ride with me. I'm going out there to deliver some stuff. Okay. So I went in and we walked into this loft and it was a place where they, they uh, printed uh, greeting cards. And I look over in the corner, there's some strange machinery. And I said to my father, well, you know, I bet they could use a good machine designer here. He says, I guess so. <laughs> and that was it. We didn't think anything about it telephone call, they wanted to see me. So I explained to them what my background was. You're hired. <laughs> so that's where I started. What year, what year was that? This was uh, in 1949, I guess. Yeah. So, um, and the place was called, at the time, was called Spiral Fastener. And that was a zipper, the plastic zipper. And you were still living in Brooklyn at yeah, that time? Yeah, I was still in Brooklyn at that time. And uh, I was the only employee, and I was running all the equipment, doing everything. And they called me Chief Project Engineer. That was my title. Anyhow, <clears throat> one day a group from Talon came in, and they looked at the thing. And I had every machine in the place going like crazy, you know. And they looked at them. Yeah, I don't think we were interested. So they left. So these people that I worked for decided they got to get some money somewhere. They're running out of money. And the, the young fellow that uh, started this uh, plastic business, uh, his father owned this greening card company. And there were times when they used to pay me through his father's pay envelope. And uh, they asked me one time, would you take stock in the company? Yes, look, I have a family to support. I can't afford to take stock instead of a <laughs> instead of a paycheck. So um, anyhow, we continued there. Then finally, they got uh, some uh, backing from uh, the um, what the hell is it? The Hay Whitney Foundation, and they got a, a slug of money. And uh, the the uh, foundation sent the guy in as general manager. And you know, they were starting to work like a business. So they moved from Long Island to New York. And uh, we were there, I don't think we were there more than two or three months when this general manager who lived in uh, Greenwich decided he didn't want to come here to New York. He wanted to go take, move the plant to, to uh, Greenwich or Stanford. And they found a place in Stanford on Greenwich Avenue. and. We moved the whole plant to... Uh, so that's how you got to Stanford? 
That's how I got to Stanford. That was in and what, year was that? what year was that? What's up? What year was that? 1952. And this is an interesting story. I don't know whether it's for the public or not, but I'm going to tell, tell it anyhow. Uh, one Sunday, we came up with both kids, Sharon and Freddie, and Jerry. And uh, we didn't know where to start. So we went to the Jewish Center. And I guess Wachowski was there at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, is there any place here where there's a Jewish neighborhood or something? Because, you know, we, we wanted to get kosher food and so on and so forth. So he said, uh, well, I don't know, maybe why don't you contact the rabbi of the temple? That was, what was his name? Uh, so, uh, not so, it was... Uh, Perlman. Hmm? Perlman. Perlman, yeah. It gets a little fuzzy up here once in a while. Perlman, right. So I got on the phone, I called Perlman, and it seems that he was in the middle of a party entertaining something. And... Uh, I said to him, I said, is there any area here where there's Jewish people who would like to be in that community? So he, he hemmed and he, he says, look, he says, I'm not a real estate agent. Why don't you contact a real estate agent and find out? Well, that was the end of that. So I went back to Chowski and I told him, he says, well, I'll tell you, we have a new rabbi in town, a young man. His he, was name young, he was young Krentz. then. <laughs> His name is Aaron Krentz. He says, I think maybe he can help you. I called up Rabbi Aaron Krentz and I explained the situation. He said, Why don't you come over with the family? So we, he lived on Rock Spring Road at the time. Uh, <coughs> we went over there. <laughs> I'll never forget. <coughs> uh, the kids he gave ice cream to. And thus he sat down and we talked. And he said, you know, there is no really Jewish area here. He says, but eventually I think there will be. He says, but, you know, there's a new development going up in Sylvan Knoll. Maybe you can get, maybe you can rent a place there. Okay. So we got a hold of the people up at Sylvan Knoll. Then, yes, we have an apartment. And that's great. So we got that apartment and we paid $80 a month. It was a two-bedroom apartment, and it had a basement, which I loved because I had a place for all my tools and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we we took the apartment, and uh, we were there, I guess, maybe for a couple of years when they decided that the $80 was too low. They're going to raise the rent. Raise the rent. They said, oh, they're going to raise the rent. It's cheap. I can buy a house and pay that on the mortgage. So uh, about that time, Morty and Rita Johnson would decide that they were going to move. And they lived on Fenway Street. And we talked to them and said, yeah, we'll make a deal. There was no real estate agent involved in that. And uh, we said, okay, uh, when, they, when can we get in? Well, they gave us a date, I don't know. Was, but it was in 1955. Uh, so uh, we decided, okay, that, so we bought their house. At that time, I think we paid, what, uh, $19,000 for the house. And we moved in, and uh, of course, uh, being mechanically inclined, I rebuilt the place. <laughs> I, I, where they had a square opening between the uh, living room and the dining room, I made an archway. I uh, paneled one wall completely uh, and uh, a few other things. And then as the kids started to grow older, I decided that we don't have enough room. So I decided I'm going to put an addition on. So I had a contractor put up the, uh, the shell and the foundation and I did the rest of the work. Built a. Uh, were you ever in that house? Oh, sure. Yeah, okay, well, you know what it would look like. And uh, I often wonder maybe I should go back sometime and see if all, if all of it's still there. <laughs> but uh, that was. Then I was there until, uh, let's see, when? Uh, until 2000, uh, 2001, you know, when Helen passed away. And uh, I decided I couldn't stay there anymore. 
it was just getting to be too much work for me, and uh, the memories and everything, I just didn't, didn't want to do it. So just about that time, fortunately, the cantor decided he wasn't going to stay in, Can in Stanford anymore. Great. I went over there, we made a deal in two minutes, and I bought his condo. And boy, did he get, make a rake off on that deal. But anyhow, I didn't care, so long as I got the place, and I got enough money from my house to pay for it, cash down, no, no mortgage. And uh, that's, where I, that's where I am now. Irv, the first time we met, you were president of, you and Helen were president of Couples Club. Right. When did that start? Uh, let's see. The Couples Club, I guess. We came here in 57, so it must have started before that. Yeah, it was about, uh, I guess about 55, 56. And what happened was uh, Rabbi Aaron Prince needed backing. He needed soldiers behind him because the uh, the uh, synagogue board was a bunch of old timers. They were giving him a hard time. So what rabbi doesn't get a hard time from the board? Right. He got his more than his share. So there was a bunch of young people who but, uh, decided, gee, some of them were religious, some were not. I said, why don't we start a couples club, young couples club? So we had a uh, few people, Erwin and uh, Marion Gans, and then we had um, oh, Marty and Dottie Rosenfeld. And who else was there? Oh, I think. Uh, Were the Weitzers uh, there? The, the Weitzers? The Weitzers, yeah. Abby and Sylvia Weitzer. And uh, Lorraine, and Mike, of Lorraine and Mark Pike, Parker. Yeah, they were also we were all part of that group. So we started the club, and uh, I, we decided we had to have a constitution. So uh, we decided that number one, you didn't have to belong to the synagogue to join the couples club, and that was the come on. Uh, but eventually, they all joined the synagogue. Right. Anyhow. They started that. Uh, then uh, Abby Weitz, who was the first president, and then Marty Rosenfeld, and I was the third president. And the gift shop started, uh, I guess, uh, uh, probably about uh, 57. Was a gift shop there? Yes, the, you had a gift shop there when I came. Yeah, and but we were schlepping the stuff. That's right. You used to schlep the right. stuff for every day. Every meeting, everything, any occasion, we used to schlep the stuff and finally got to a point. Well, what happened was, they built, at that point, they built the uh, chapel downstairs and they were making room for a gift shop. So that took us off the hook. And uh, I don't remember who was the first. I think the, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Sylvia Plotkin. Plotkin, Sylvia. She took over. She was, she was active in, uh, in history. Sister would. So she took over the gift shop, and uh, Dottie Rosenfeld took over after that. And but we we never had any more to do with the, with the gift shop other than uh, just buying stuff there. When did the late uh, late Friday night services start at uh, Go to Shalom? Oh, they they started when uh, when, when we first came. came? Here, when we first came to Stanford. As a matter of fact, that's how we, and when we met uh, Rabbi Ann Prince, he told us to come to the Friday night services. Now, normally, my wife wouldn't write on Shabbos, so what we used to do, we'd pack a couple of blocks away, and, she, and we used to walk, so she'd feel like she's walking yeah. to the synagogue. And then and so she nice. was, she was the religious one in your family. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, oh, until my daughter grew up. <laughs> and then, uh, that went off. As a matter of fact, one night uh, the rabbi couldn't couldn't come. Or something happened, so he asked me to take over to serve me. So I said, "Okay, I'll do the English, but the cantor has to do the Hebrew." <laughs> so, was Sholem uh, Cohen there? Yeah, then? Sholem. Oh, Sholem. Boy, I, the stories with Sholem is really something. This was one incident that's very interesting. He. Um, he came into the rabbi, I was down at the time, he came into the rabbi's office and he says, Rabbi, is that your car out there? Rabbi says, yeah. 
is, oh, I just hit your car. <laughs> Sean wasn't a very good driver. <laughs> no. And then, then if anybody complained about his uh, singing, he said, look, you want a Perry Como? You pay for a Perry Como. And, and well, that was a time when they tried to get rid of him. Yeah. And he said, if they wanted a Perry Como. <laughs> yeah. uh, one interesting story. I don't know whether ra the rabbi or Joe remember it, but uh, the rabbi was teaching a class, Joe uh, Lieberman's class, a bunch of wild kids. But since Joe was related to the rabbi through marriage, yes. he, Joe was his favorite that he'd pick on. One day, a cat walked into the into the downstairs, and he pointed Joe, Joe, get rid of that cat. So Joe picks the cat up and takes it outside. A couple of minutes later, he comes back. Rabbi says, what'd you do with the cat? Oh, he went up to join the temple. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a very interesting thing. Anyhow, uh, it went on, and then, uh, of course, I did a lot of work uh, for the new, the new show. And every time the phone rang and it was a rabbi, I said, oh, new project. Because any time you needed something, he'd give me a call and i come up. One day, this was funny, one day he gives give me a call. Hi, Shane. My grandson in law. Uh, one day he gives me a call. He said, Irv, you busy? I said, Well, I'm going out now, but what is it? He said, Well, I have some people here from New York. They saw your work here and I'd like to talk to you. I said, Oh, gee whiz, I don't know. He said, But don't come in overalls. I said, What do you mean overalls? I'm ready to go to have dinner. I'm not in overalls. So, uh, he says, okay, well, could you make it? And I says, all right, I'll go over and see what they want. So I loaded Helen into the car, and we went over there. And Helen was sitting there uh, in the car. And I said, no, come up with me, honey. I want you to meet these people. I don't know who they are. We start up the stairs, and the first thing I know, happy birthday! <laughs> that was my 70th birthday. That's your 70th birthday. Yeah. Were you there at the time? No, nope, you know I that? wasn't. Oh. Well, we, I thought half of Stanford was there, yeah. but uh, anyway, that was my 70th birthday party. And uh, well, we went on, on, of course, every time the rabbi had a, uh, an project. a project or an explosion in the board, he'd call all the young people together, you got to back me up. So um, we got him out of a lot of tight spots. One time, he was almost ready to resign. You remember Rosenzweig? Mm, yes. Yeah. So uh, we finally got rid of Rosenzweig. Yes, I remember that. So, and uh, that was about that life in Stanford was cool, soft. <laughs> well, Irv, do uh, you have anything around here you want to show us about some of the work you've done? or? Well, I have some stuff here if you want to. You want to tell us about Oh, it? yeah. Okay. Now this, <clears throat> this was one of the men many menorahs I made. Uh, we used to do craft shows and display them. And uh, every once in a while we get a call from someplace somewhere in the United States and they want a menorah and I'd make them something. Matter of fact, I have menorahs all over the United States. <laughs> then, of course, we went to, we, uh, as I say, we uh, exhibited at the craft shows. And uh, this is one of the How last... How long did it take to make it? Oh, I don't remember. I'd, I'd say probably maybe 10 hours or so. Out of what kind of wood is it made? It's made out of uh, oak and uh, walnut. The serve? Well, <laughs> I, start, I started, uh, since I had nothing to do with my spare three or four minutes, uh, <coughs> I decided I wanted to do something. I, and I found out that they were giving an art course at the uh, as a government center. So uh, and then it, it made it convenient because they picked me up and to take me there and bring me back again, all for a buck per ride. So that can't be that. No, can't. So I decided I'd go there and uh, I started out 
As a matter of fact, I think I have some of the original paintings that uh, this is, incidentally, is my studio. <laughs> currently working on. Not finished yet. And a lot of details I gotta work yeah. in that. Oh that is something I is another one of this is something I made out in California. It's uh, slip casting. Mm. It, uh, I made it out of three molds. This was one, this was second, and the base was a third. And all of this stuff was handmade that's on the bottom. That was on exhibit there, too. And where are your grandchildren today? Hmm? Your grandchildren are all here? Yeah, uh, no, well, <clears throat> my. Uh, most of my grandchildren, well, let's see, I, Ronnie, Jody is here, Shane is here, um, Sarah is first of my great-grandchildren, she's here, and uh, the two twins are here, of course, and I got one out in California, where's her picture, there it is right there, that's the one in California, whoop, easy. This is your ca California great-grandchild. Yeah. She's, that kid is, she's three years old and she's a whiz. <laughs> well, you know what they say, if you had known grandchildren were going to be so wonderful, you'd have them first. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. paper sculpture. I had a one day lesson though. <laughs> and then, then we made the, uh, the box of it. So. The shadow box. Yeah. Right now, Freddie is the arms and I'm the brains. <laughs> That's just, oh, I, yeah, I think I do have something I could show you if you're still interested. should get some at the beginning, that's it. You did. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you for giving us this interview today. Thank you. You will become part of the archives <coughs> of the Stanford oh, yeah. Historical Society. Yeah. Oh, well, and we'll know a little bit about what Stanford was like when you came here. Right. And that's a, uh, it's, it's nothing uh, like when I came here. <laughs> Four, 14,000 people, all the Jewish settlement was on Pacific Street. Brazel was the butcher. Uh, Sam, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sachs was the, the plumbing supply, and uh, a few of the others. I don't know. I mean, it's nothing like it was. Well, the Pacific is, the Street is now the mall. <laughs> it's now the mall, that's right, yeah. But we like it, and uh, we made this our home. <laughs>